I welcome everyone to the 27th meeting of the local, local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones? As meeting papers are provided in digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. The agenda item one, the committee is invited to consider whether to take its consideration of evidence on pre-budget scrutiny at agenda item three in private. Are we all agreed? Great. Thank you. Second agenda item is pre-budget scrutiny on housing adaptations and the committee is today holding a roundtable evidence session with a number of stakeholders in preparation for the publication of the Scottish Government budget towards the end of the year. We also intend to write to the Scottish Government before the budget is published, setting out some pre-budget recommendations. We cannot do this without expert input, which is why your presence today is so important. The focus today is on housing adaptations. It's also in the wider context of considering the suitability of our housing for the disabled and veterans and for an ageing population and about how this should be reflected in the Scottish budget. So can I welcome you all here today and perhaps we could start off by going round the table and introducing ourselves. I'll start with me and then go round to my right. I'm James Dorn and I'm the convener of the committee. I'm Monica Lennon and I'm the deputy convener of the committee. I'm Jenny Ling and I am representing Aberdeen's um, Health and Social Care Partnership today. Uh, my name is Tony Cain and I'm the Policy Manager for the Association of Local Authority Chief Housing Officers. Uh, Andy Whiteman, MSP for Lothian. And uh, Nora Urich from the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Annabel Ewing, uh, MSP for Cowden Beath constituency. Mark Fari of Hanover Housing Association. We're a specialist provider of uh, elderly persons housing. Uh, Lisa Innes, I'm a housing advisor at Glasgow Centre for Inclusive Living. Moira Beam from Housing Options. Scotland. Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. Sorry. That's all right. Yes. I'd, 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 sorry. I, 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 apologies. I usually don't matter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Graham Simpson, MSP for Central Scotland. Right. Moira. Yes, apologies. Yes, yes. I've said who I am twice now. Alexander Stewart, MSP for Mid Scotland Fife. Uh, Fiona King from Shelter Scotland. Uh, Kenneth Gibson, MSP for Cunningham North. And obviously we have the clerks uh, to our left here. Uh, okay, look, can I start off the questions just by kick it or kick off the whole thing by just uh, uh, asking a general question about your views and the outcomes for people needing housing adaptations across all tenures, and is there evidence of the benefits of preventive spend uh, in this field? Would anybody like to kick that off? Mark, off just by. Um giving a comment that um, we see many cases where um, prior to uh, one of the most common adaptations that we do, which is the replacement of bathrooms with level floor access showers, previously um, residents may have needed the help of a carer or two to come in and help them bathe, which obviously is uh, a resource from uh, elsewhere uh, in the public sector. Uh, once those bathrooms get replaced with level access floor showers, uh, in many cases, uh, residents are able to look after their own bathing needs and don't need that extra assistance that comes in. And in most cases, uh, our residents tend to be single people. They, they don't have the benefit of a partner or spouse with them. So um, prior to that adaptation, it does need assistance from outside to come in. Um, after it, it, it doesn't. Thank you. Does anybody else have any views? Or to that as well about the, the impact actually on unpaid carers of the the adaptation as well and um, really needing to consider that in terms of the the wider aspect of the the carers act which obviously came in a couple of years ago and um, the fact that people do not have that adaptation can have huge implications on the health and safety of the carer and um, on the stress level of the carer and can lead to breakdowns in in the care being provided which ultimately then causes resource to have to be spent in other um, areas as well so I think that's an important consideration um, for the individual themselves but how they're also supported in the community. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to come in at this point? If not, yes. Yeah, um, so we had our housing inquiry where we looked at accessible housing for disabled people and um, one of the things that we found is that disabled people who are in accessible housing or adequate housing um, that meets their needs, they're four times more likely to be in employment. So, I mean, it, it comes back to what we were saying earlier about how when you spend money on adaptations or on accessible housing, you save money or gain money in other ways. That's an interesting statistic, four times. 
evidence. We have evidence, particularly when there are um, disabled children in the family, that having the right adaptation, the right house, it keeps the family together. It enables the, the parents to continue working if, 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 if that's what they want to do. It has much wider societal benefits. So for a relatively small cost of an adaptation, you can, you know, you can see that spend just, you know, kind of be, being kind of cascaded throughout the, the, the local community and, and beyond. Okay, thank you. So I, mean, I think that's all very true. It's so when you, when, when an, the appropriate adaptation is delivered and it's delivered at the right time, it can make an enormous difference to the experience and the life of, of, of the household that, that benefit from it. I think the evidence is, though, that there are too many folk who aren't getting the adaptation, the right adaptation, as quickly as they need it, and that experience of that process, and it was demonstrated by the ECHR's report, the experience of the adaptations process is uh, often not a good one. Is really the reason we're here is to try and thrash that out and see if there's some way that we can improve it. Okay, uh, Andy, you wanted to ask a, que a couple of questions. Yeah, it was just interesting to look at the, the kind of budgets for um, uh, spend in this uh, area to the extent that we've got them over the last three years have been pretty flat, um, very flat, in fact. Um, number of, numbers of adaptations in RSLs, for example, you know, just above 3,000 for the last. Um, uh, three years. Obviously, there is a big question about how much money we need to spend and how we should spend it, and I think we'll explore some of them. But I just wondered if there were any ways in which we could lever in other sources of funding um, through existing housing investment in the private sector. 73% of older people live in private housing, um, or through the tax system. Um, any thoughts? So, sorry, Andy, sorry. Uh, can, can, just before we go on to answer that, can I just say that if anybody wishes to comment, if they could just catch my eye, we would like to get a free-flowing discussion going on here, uh, but if you could just let me know so that we're not all talking over each other. Would anybody like to come in on the, the point that Andy raised? Well, I perhaps uh, just say that we, we, uh, we mentioned it in our evidence. We have a, a scheme called Access Ownership, which is a partnership between ourselves and the Link Group. It's a very, very flexible shared ownership scheme. It can e enable people either to stay in their existing property or to move to a more suitable property. They can own a share of the property and rent a share of the property from the Link Group. Um, and that's been a way of Link using its, its assets uh, you know, to convert for, for wider community benefit. And there's no reason why that couldn't be extended to other RSLs who've got the financial capacity to do that. So that'd be one way of, of, of using what's, the money that's in the existing system that isn't being, being utilised at present. Widely, at what kind of scale is that operating on? Well, we, we've done, I think, between 20 and 25 over the past five years. So it's, it's, it's a small, it's a niche scheme. Um, the, the Link Group uses it's used 1.5 million pounds of its own reserves, and there's other other finance goes into the scheme. Um, they would they'd be able to take on more applicants, um, and we feel that other RSLs might be in a similar position. Some of the bigger RSLs who've got substantial asset base could perhaps look at. Entry into some kind of shared ownership arrangement. Um. I think the difficulty with, with the numbers you have in front of you is that there are there there are less than half of the total expenditure on adaptations going on. We have a ten-year base set of funding streams here, so those that's the stage three, and so for housing associations provided directly by the Better Homes Division of the Scottish Government, and the money provided to Glasgow and Edinburgh Council through the transfer of the Management and Development Fund of the TMDF councils. On top of that, some housing associations are committing their own resources to fund those adaptations because the 10 million no longer covers the whole of the cost of adaptations in housing associations. It's been frozen for a number of years. I don't think we know how much money some housing associations are putting in, but it's pretty inconsistent across the RSL sector whether or not they simply wait for grant to be available or whether they carry out works up front and then reclaim the grant or whether they carry the cost of the work themselves. We haven't seen those figures. Uh, and on top of that, there is owners who will be making contribution in some instances to adaptations to their own homes and a, and a very substantial sum from local government, at least £16 million pounds a year uh, in local government, which is, being, which is funding uh, adaptations in the local authority stock the key point there being that tenants of council houses are the only group who pay for the whole of the cost of their own adaptations from their own rent. Everybody else gets some degree of subsidy. But on top of that, you also have, I think, GHA, who are not accessing TMDF for stage three adaptations and paying for their adaptations. And so, so it's a very complicated 
tenure-based, sometimes landlord-specific system, and it's not clear how much is being spent and the extent to which it is actually meeting the demand that's arising. So therefore, it would be very difficult to say uh, if we knew if the stage three budget was being spent as efficiently, uh, being used as efficiently as it was, or if RSLs should increase their own spend and adaptations because we don't know how much they're spending. I, I think that's absolutely true, but the, the, the key difference is that the stage three budget is, is the one that's the only one that's being managed out with the IJBs. So where the Scottish Government required local authorities to transfer, they transfer statutory responsibility and the funding streams to the local IJB uh, as part of that setup. So the um, grants for owners coming from local government is theoretically administered by the IJB and the HRA adaptation theoretically is administered, although for the most part they're not. They're simply delegated back to the local authority. So there's been no real change in what's going on there. Um, the stage three adaptations money, the 10 million, uh, is administered wholly out with the rest of the process. It's completely separate. Okay. Okay. Does anybody else want to come in on this? Could I maybe come in? Um, I uh, actually got in touch with some of our local RSLs um, in Aberdeen, and just to give some idea of an indication of figures that we're really speaking about. Um, so if I can use uh, my colleagues in Castle Hill Housing Association, um, they made uh, an estimated budget that they would require for the year at 120,000 um, to serve the properties that they have in the city, Aberdeenshire, and in their Murray areas. Um, what they actually received was 66,000 and that money has now been committed um, at this point in the year. So they're having to look at alternative um, sources of, of funding and things. If you break that down into terms of the local authority area, that's only 22,000. I'll have lax a shower at the cost of maybe five or 6,000. It's, it's not having the, maybe perhaps the impact that, that we expect it to have. Um, given the, the money. So well, it does take you back to the point that Andy was talking about at the very beginning. Is there some way that you can leave it in? Yes, alternatives, possibly. But it was yeah. just to give a real life yeah. example yeah. of the yeah. type of um, funds that we're speaking about. Kind of yes, yeah. so I noticed in, uh, thanks, Convener. I noticed in the Housing Options Scotland submission, you, you say that with regard to veteran clients, we feel the veterans' charitable sector is a potential area of untapped funding. I um, just wonder if you could talk a wee bit more about, about that. Okay, well, um, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, people will know that the, 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 the veterans' charities are relatively well off. They, they, they tend to have, you know, substantial asset bases. And, and our experience is that they tend to be not that active in housing in Scotland. So there are, there are big veterans' charities who do very little in Scotland, not, not because they don't want to, because, because they really don't know how to, and they've concentrated on, on England. So an example would be the Hague Housing Trust, that, um, that helps ex-RAF personnel, and it has several million pounds worth of assets, they have very little stock in Scotland and they have they have only one part-time member of staff. So we, we think that there's opportunities there for Hague Housing Trust to perhaps offer individual housing solutions to, to our clients, either by, by purchasing and renting to them or by lending them the deposit to do something through the lift scheme or um, PRS, you know, paying the rent in advance or whatever. So we, we think that's an, an area for potential growth. And so far, we've been um, very heartened by the response we've had from the veteran sector because they want to help people and they're just struggling at the minute to know how best to do that. Thanks very much for that. Yeah, Alexander wanted to come in then. Yeah, can I just take on board what Jenny was saying earlier? If the supply and demand situation that you've just given us an example of uh, is universal, and it probably is reasonable to accept that that is the case across most uh, local authorities and most, uh, most locations across Scotland, then how, how do you see this being improved? Because if, if, if you cannot get the uh, support and funding initially, uh, then you're delaying and you're putting off and you're progressing uh, uh, individuals and in, 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 in for whatever reason, uh, and how do how do the council and the uh, and the health board etc even manage that crisis because that can be a crisis if there is not the supply and the uh, support mechanisms taking place uh, and that's going to create a massive backlog for us nationally. Yep, I can come in on that. I mean, certainly the um, we've had examples um, where we have had individuals who are in RSL properties who have then applied for local authority housing and had to move because um, of their their adaptation being being held up and things. There are undoubtedly um, delays that are caused. Locally in Aberdeen, we have actually looked at um, different interim housing options for people um, to, as a stopgap, but undoubtedly there are people out there who are waiting for adaptations, which, picking up on March point, it then ends up to, to 
causing uh, pressure on the services elsewhere. I don't know, Tony, if you want to come in on that. On, on, I mean, timescales for the measure in the um, in the ARC, the, the statutory return from local authorities and housing associations, is a time from rec completion of the recommendation to the completion of the application, so when you receive the OT recommendation. And that varies quite dramatically across the piece. I, I'm sure I said in evidence last year, it's the one indicator in the ARC in which local authorities outperform housing associations reasonably consistently. consistently. I'm not suggesting that local authorities do as well as we should do, but it is the one area where we do better. And you are looking at periods of between four and five weeks in well-performing authorities to 50, 60 weeks in poorly performing uh, instances. And that variation is evident across Scotland. Can I ask just on that then, the reason for that would be what the, the, the local authorities have got a system in place and or the RSLs don't want to spend it, the money or what? It, it is in part linked to the to the funding arrangement. Well, I should say we, we have from 2012 a clear set of recommendations from the Adapting for Change uh, Working Group, which the government accepted at that time, which set out how to address these issues. But typically in a local authority, it will be a demand, a budget will be fixed at the beginning of the year, but it will effectively be seen as a demand-led budget and the local authority will continue to spend on adaptations until all the adaptations are done. What you won't get is a point in the year when the budget is spent and the work stops. For many associate, typically, I'm not yeah, saying university, okay, typically, okay. and, and we, I did some work on this last in preparation for last year's committee, and we went round all the local authorities and asked about their processes and asked about their spend. So, and that was typically the response that was coming back. What you see in some housing associations is slightly different because their expectation is that the adaptation will be largely funded from the state street um, grant. If the grant isn't available, then in many cases the adaptation won't be done until it is available. In some cases they will carry out the work and then claim the money at the start of next year. So you begin each year in many areas with a big chunk of the grant spent. So that, it does result in sometimes quite substantial delays for even quite minor adaptations. Okay, thank you. Wouldn't you like, if you want to end first, Annabelle, I know Just you want to probably come major on Tony's point about the wait list, given what we do, we're, we're almost a bit more tenure neutral than, than some people around the table, because we necessarily only see it when um, systems and processes have, have broken down to the extent that a, a third party advocacy is required. But those wait times, um, that the kind of national figures can hold, hide a huge local variation, housing association, local council. But depending on your the need, it can be years and years and years, depending on the extent to the adaptations or if um, conditions are progressive, so the need is changing, or if there are uh, children or uh, it's a large family with a disabled child and potentially one of the adults has a, a, a need as well so um, people only come to us when their situation basically becomes unbearable and I think um, lots of people in their evidence have submitted you know um, quite poignant case studies that show how much people will put up with because they've got no choice but um, that's when the systems are breaking down and the processes are breaking down and I think um, ourselves and other people around the room but other disability charities that we work with or who come to us for advice or legal advocacy um, it, because of the pressure on the system and the lack of funding and the lack of availability of accessible or adaptable housing it we're, we're almost in a sort of it's the it's the squeaky nail that's getting the oil so if you if you if you have an advocate who can push your case for you that is what is in some cases getting you the adaptation that you need but but there's needs all over the country that aren't being met because of a, a mixture of the funding, the processes, and the complexity of the issue. Because it's not a, necessarily about time quotas, it's about making sure that a house meets the, the household's needs, not just in the very, very short term. I think that's the difficulty with, with some of the disabilities and, and the ageing population. And uh, it's quite a um, complex thing to meet the needs currently, but then also... Uh, future needs. You don't want to meet a, 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 do an expensive adaptation that is not going to last the year or two years or three years. Okay, uh, Mark and then Annabelle, because I know you want. To. Thank you. Just to um, working for a, a housing association myself, Hanover, I, I can talk about the, the the stage three claiming experience and bidding experience to flesh out what Tony and, and other people were saying earlier. Um, I think if you were able to look at the exact figures, I think you'd find that, generally speaking, over the last three years, that in aggregate, housing association bids for adaptations in anticipation of the demands from the waiting list they already have and the extra applications or referrals they'd expect during the ensuing year have probably been had to be cut back by about 40% to square off with that £10 million budget. 
Um, my understanding is that the, the 10 million comes from the greater housing investment budget that also funds new build housing. Um, other things to um, just, just brief you on in terms of figures. Um, yes, we do fund some ourselves. Um, the, the more minor ones, like grab rails, up to two or three hundred pound, we, we, we go ahead with ourselves once we get the referrals from the OTs. We don't wait to um, make a call on stage three funds for that. Yes, we do, in many cases, fund ahead ourselves in anticipation of getting an allocation the next year. Um, so we cash flow to, to quite a large extent these um, installations. Um, we don't generally get announcement of our allocation compared to what we bid for until about June. Now, I don't know whether it's possible to bring that forward a few months to the start of the year, but that, that would certainly help us knowing what, what we can programme for, for the year. And just looking at the last full financial year, 1718, that we've got figures for, um, the average waiting time between us receiving the referral from the occupational therapist to be able to complete the work was 217 days. And uh, the previous year, um, it was less. It was 193 days. And the year before that, in 1516, it was 134 days. So in, in our particular case, and I'm not claiming this is exactly the same in all housing associations, over the last three years, there has been about a 50% increase in the waiting time between the occupational therapist referral and us being able to complete the work. And what would you put that down to? Beg your pardon? What would you put that down to? Um, there's probably no one reason. Um, we certainly have to wait initially. If, if we haven't always got funds to call on from the allocation and we feel that we've committed our, enough of our own funds first to front load the funding before claiming it back, there will be, if you like, um, an extra group of referrals that we've received that we can't make progress on. And so that, that would be the main influence on the figure, I would say. Uh, uh, are the numbers going up of referrals that you're getting? Um, I'd say it's fairly consistent. Right. Um, yeah. In our case, anywhere between 100 and 150 a year. Uh, I want Annabelle in first. OK, uh, thank you, convener. Um, just picking up on some of the, the issues raised just uh, in the last wee while, uh, on the issue of the, the OT uh, uh, part of the process, I mean, obviously, it, you know, looking at it from the perspective of the individual seeking an adaptation, um, an issue will be raised, but there may be a period of time within which the OT is not instructed. So it's not, you know, somebody mentioned that the... Alako mentioned that... You know, looking at certain timeframes from the trigger of the completion by the OT of their report, but of course there can be a period of time during which the OT is not instructed for whatever reason, which uh, may be a management process on the part of the the uh, instructing, you know, organisation, be RSLs or local authorities, be the IGB. But for the individual, there's just a period of time that nothing is happening because the OT hasn't actually been instructed to go and do anything. So I don't think it's you know just looking at how long it takes the OT from the invest you know their uh, on-site investigation to completing a report. It's not really that. It's how the authority and the organisation manage that process. Um, and it would be interesting to hear if people felt that there would be a better way to manage that process because I don't think that individuals feel that the process itself is actually serving their needs. And that brings in bigger questions about looking at. Uh, obviously, as far as uh, local authority and private sector adaptations are concerned, the, the situation has only relatively recently changed to have IJBs at the, the head of this. And I just would be interested to hear how people feel uh, that that is going. Tony, do you want to come in and listen in? Jenny and then... On, on the previous point around around the budget, if you'll forgive me, although I, I have a, a comment to make on that, but I'm, I'm happy to wait. Just I, a colleague of mine did a calculation around where the current stage adaptations is relative to um, bids from housing associations and how that has changed, and she's suggesting that around the current situation is bids amount to about just shy of £17 million on a £10 million budget. 
and that's gone up from about 13.5 million in 15-16. So the, the mismatch between the current demand for adaptations from housing associations and the existing budget, and I'm happy to provide a copy of this to the committee if, if that would be useful. So, so the, the, I mean, the issues have been getting worse over time, and it is the case that demand in housing associations is substantially outstripping the 10 million that's currently being made, made available. Sorry. Jenny, you want to speak? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting points, and I would uh, agree with all of those. There are a couple of things that are going on at the moment that address those type of issues. Um, so um, I was also part of the Adapting for Change uh, pilot sites, uh, the demonstration sites, and one of the, the key um, areas that came from that was training, which is being offered out to um, wider health and social care staff as well as uh, colleagues in housing. And it was around um, identifying of early housing needs, so whether it be adaptation or rehousing needs, and, and doing uh, quite a lot of work there to make sure that housing is everyone's business. The other thing that goes alongside that is um, the Royal College of Occupational Therapists have a document which is currently being updated um, and should be released in February uh, about minor adaptations without delay. And again, that's about facilitating um, non-OT staff to do those um, assessments for, for more basic bits of equipment, for example, your grab rails, external handrails that don't require specialist assessment, um, so therefore cuts out the, the delay in, in that. Um, one of the things we did look under Adapting for Change as well was a 10-year neutral pathway and looked at, at pathways into the service and how do people know how to navigate the, the system and so forth as well. So um, it, in Aberdeen, we have our 10-year neutral pathway in terms of who communicates with who when. The, the bit that falls down is how quickly someone would actually get their adaptation depending on their, their tenure and depending on the time of year. <laughs> I just wonder um, how we can find out in terms of uh, the very practical uh, uh, development that has taken place such that OTs themselves do not have to make the assessment for some adaptations, which helps to unblock uh, the system. How can we find out how that actually is happening across Scotland? Because I think that seems to be a bit of a theme in terms of the, the IGB approach. We, we don't seem to have hard information about what the spend of each IGB is mm -hmm. on adaptations across Scotland. We don't seem to have information about how each IGB is going to respond to the, you mentioned the uh, TICE, uh, t um, the site test pilot evaluation. And I think the ball is now in the court of the IGBs to come back and say how they specifically are going to respond to the various points raised. How do we get a picture across Scotland? Because that really is what our constituents, I think, want us to to find out. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, briefly, and then I want to bring in... I, I think the answer is you would need to ask all 32 That's IJBs, but exactly. I would add to that and say IJBs have no additional resources allocated to them in relation to adaptations other than money from council tenants, which is delegated usually back straight to the council, and money for... I'd like to know what they spend as a yeah, starter yeah, for 10, you know, before we can make any further assessments. Well. Um, so that's the information I think that's missing. Yeah, it'd be useful to have that. I, I'm not sure that most IJBs will be able to readily answer that question. We well, can find that out. That raises issues about process then, doesn't it? Yeah, so right. We can find out. Graham? Yeah, ju just on that very very point, actually, um, we, uh, the committee, had a letter from Kevin Stewart um, dated 3rd of April um, where he had written to uh, 31 IJBs uh, about this. Um, uh, Mr. Stewart said uh, in April 23 replies had been received as methods used to record expenditure differ across partnerships and some, some were unable to provide figures for 2015-16 it's not possible to provide the committee with a detailed breakdown of spend so I, I think you can see there there's a, a rather confused picture uh, with IJBs we've We've certainly found it as a, a committee when we've not just on adaptations, but in looking at the you know, local authority uh, budgets, it's a, it's, you know, it's a little bit of a, a confused picture. Um, so I certainly think that that needs to be sorted out. Um, in the uh, Equalities and Human Rights Commission uh, report, uh, they call for changes to funding arrangements for, for adaptations. Uh, say it's uh, urgently required. Um, so I just wonder if you, if people can, 
comment on a the confused picture of the IJBs uh, and the need to change funding arrangements. Okay, does so anybody have any comments you'd like to come in on, on that? Looks like you're talking. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I've already said I, I, I think the position with the variety of funding streams and the way in which the money is managed and the position of the IJBs, the IJBs are in a very difficult position because they're not in control of all the resources and they're not necessarily responsible for reporting how those resources are spent. So local authorities are still reporting. Um, their spend on the HRA independently of the IJB, although the IJB is technically responsible for that bit of it, which is in relation to adaptation. So, to be fair, it's a very, very confused picture uh, about where money is spent and who's responsible for it. So, I'm, I'm, you know, I wouldn't give the IJBs too much of a hard time on that one. My apologies. There was a second part to your question, and it, it, it slipped my mind. It, it, it was the uh, report from the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. You mentioned it uh, in, in, in your evidence. Um, yeah, we've we, we've certainly uh, covered this previously, uh, but the point still stand. You know, there's been little progress yeah. in the adaptations process. Um, they call for changes to funding arrangements. Um, together, uh, the implementation of common parts regulations is urgently required to ensure that disabled people are able to get the adaptations they need. They're, That's what they say. Yeah, and and they're effectively asking for the implementation of recommendations that were made in 2012. Yeah. And those have been extant since the Adaptive for Change report was published. So presumably nothing's happened since 2012. We, we don't have a single 10-year neutral funding stream to support the allocations, but the adaptations process. And I think the other thing that's interesting about the ECR's report is if you look at how it describes the experience of clients going through the adaptations process, it precisely mirrors the way that experience was described by the Adapting for Change Working Group in 2012. So there's been, there appears to have been very little change on how people feel about the adaptations process that they experience, but also the way in which the key elements of it are organised, and particularly finance. It's not moved on. Nora, you wanted to? Yeah, um, just to reiterate what Tony was already saying, I mean, a lot of it comes back to things that we previously mentioned. So, um, you know, the funding available for RSLs, the 10 million that that doesn't cover, the actual need, um, then that you have different streams for different tenures. Um, so it's a wide variety of things, but yes. Um, and then with the common parts, uh, I should say that we, um, every six months, somebody in the legal team at the EHRC writes a letter to the government to ask about the common parts regulations. And um, in a recent meeting, we've been assured that they're working on it, but it's taking a long time. Uh, so I think we'll see something at some point, but um, it's something that we've been saying for a long time, and not just us, a lot of other people as well. Are you able to uh, share that correspondence with the committee? Um, I don't know, I'll have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> it may be helpful if, if you can. Thank you. Does anybody in the site have any comment to make, Lisa? Um, it's just a general comment. Obviously, I do advice work, and it's a bewildering process, I think, for clients. We've got so much going on in their lives to try and sort of, I don't know, go through the adaptations process themselves. They're kind of a bit lost with it all. Um, so I think um, blowing around trumpets a bit and other um, advice organisations, I think we're an important part of doing sort of hand-holding and helping people through it. They maybe get so far and, you know, an obstacle where there's no money or what have you, or um, an adaptation can't be done at all because they need to move. Um, and what we find as well, even if adaptations are being done, sometimes there can be de a delay while they're getting done because there can be poor workmanship. So we'll go and see someone well, we've had a wet room put in, actually the water's not draining, we're having to wait six weeks to get fixed, there's no overall person in charge of it, so they're sent here, they're in everywhere, and I think, you know, we work with a vulnerable client group, um, and I think that has to be taken on board, and I think it's all very well if someone accesses us for advice, but I think there are an awful lot of people out there that kind of give up. So, can I just clarify there when you say there's not one person overseeing it are you saying then for example the rsl or the council would say the work's getting done somebody would come in and do the work yeah. but then if that doesn't work somebody else has got i to think be no, there can be a lot of contractors involved yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. in it and oh well, they need to come well actually they need to come and i think you know people say to us i've made phone call and phone call and it's sitting there it's really frustrating because i've got yeah. a wet room that i can't yeah. actually use at the moment yeah. because i'm having to make phone calls people don't turn up etc 
Lisa makes, and it is a source of incredible frustration to my constituents in, in Cowdenbeath mm -hmm. constituency, and I'm sure uh, those across Scotland. And it, it always, you know, it raises the question, looking at this issue from the other side, what is the, what is the supply arrangement in place on the part of RSLs? I mean, is this a lot of money? And we want to ensure that it's being spent properly for the benefit of the people uh, who should expect this service. So what are, what are the arrangements in place on the part of each IGB, each RSL, in terms of getting this work done? How do they approach that? You know, how seriously do they take it? Is there a clerk of works? What happens when something doesn't happen that should have happened? How quickly is that rectified? These are really important practical questions, uh, convener, I think that we should be trying to, to get to the bottom of. Uh, and can I ask you that you draw my attention? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I had... Somebody else was just about I'm sorry, terribly sorry, I thought <laughs> I had drawn. <laughs> Monica. Um, thank you, Kimbira. Just to go back to um, a comment, Lisa, that, that you made a, a few uh, seconds ago, you said that people get to a point where they might give up. W what happens when someone gives up? What's the consequences for, for people? Well, I think they just kind of make do. I mean, we do have clients that, you know, especially with a disabled child in the household, they're lifting them, carrying into a bath, etc., because some of them kind of fall through you know, fall through the loop in terms of how connected they are with social work as well. Um, you know, we'll get people phoning up, what do I do? I, I don't even know where to start. How do I get someone out to give me an assessment? There's kind of an impasse. And, and you know, with the best will in the world, there's such a pressure on all statutory agencies. Um, and obviously, we only see the clients that come to us. I mean, there's such an unmet need. So. Thank okay. you. I just wondered, um, convener, if, if, you know, if there are people who who give up or they don't continue to fight for the case, if then the, the waiting times that, that we see don't fully reflect the, the level of need. And again, mm. just if I can come in, I was struck by um, Shelter Scotland's written submission because, Fiona, you mentioned the case study of Linda and some of us heard from Linda in Parliament um, a few weeks ago at Shelter's um, reception in, in the garden lobby. And, you know, we're hearing mm -hmm. people who are, who are trapped in their, in their own homes, albeit whether it's temporary accommodation or otherwise. And I think the um, EHRC Commission report on, on your inquiry talks about some of these extreme cases of people waiting more than a decade, I think in the most extreme case, up to 18 mm -hmm. years. So we've got the, the current needs that we know about and there's that mismatch in resource. But sitting here, we need to think about the longer term as well, because we know that this, this need is only going to increase. So are there ideas you know, beyond just funding, which we've talked about already today, but looking at, you know, building standards, looking at planning to make sure that, that we are building homes for the future that are going to meet all of our needs, because any one of us could become disabled um, and need accessible housing. So, you know, what are the ideas around that? Fiona, do you want to come in and ask? Yeah, I mean, I think, thanks, Monica, for, for raising those kind of case studies. We included a couple of the many that we have, and I'm sure other agencies could speak to similar kind of levels of, of case examples. But they, it's important to point out that they do represent the people who have come to us and who have got advocacy, and it can still take a number of years to resolve that um, adaptation requirement, and that's with, with all of our resources as well. So for the people who don't um, have have the the ability at that time to seek external advocacy who knows what you know how long those adaptations can can take if at all i think the case of uh, disabled children that comes up uh, quite frequently for us because the parents are willing to put up with quite a lot well more than they they ever should have to to carry children up and down flights of stairs and and do all sorts of things which are just not appropriate they're not got the best interest of the child um it's not it's not appropriate for for anyone involved and in terms of um the work that uh, nora the hrc uh, uh, that that report speaks to is that that you know we, we all want everyone to have good quality adequate housing that meets their needs and the picture emerging is that that is just not the case for lots of people and it is the people with vulnerabilities and additional needs um, and that's on top of mainstream waiting lists, homelessness waiting lists. We put just a few statistics in our submission, but in terms of the overall picture, the, the housing crisis that we're in, we're not meeting need in many different ways, and this is just an additional pressure on the system, and that's what we're seeing. It, what everyone's speaking to around the room is that there is so much pressure on house building and statutory services and support and adaptations that 
uh, the system is is struggling to respond to those in a way that we would all want them to, which is quickly and, and promptly and, and, and meeting those needs. I think um, the report that Shelter Scotland had commissioned with the EHRC looking at um, all 32 local authorities' strategic housing plans showed that essentially the 50,000 target for, for um, new houses will will most probably be met according to the plans and what have you, which is really, really positive, and that does represent that step change in affordable housing supply. However, chiming with what other people have said about data, there are gaps in the data, and I think the headline was very positive from that report, but the, the kind of subheading was the picture's quite, quite murky, and it, that was a quite a sophisticated bit of external research and that was all they were able to pull together. There are gaps in the data about what, what housing is being built, where, for whom, what the, what the profile is. Um, and I think without really improving the, the data on the need, but also on how we're meeting it, there is going to be this mismatch. It's a, it, we know that roughly 12% of the housing that's going to be built by 2021 will be specialist, but we don't know much more than that, and that covers a quite a, a broad spectrum of need-based housing but it doesn't all mean it's accessible or wheelchair access so without more detailed breakdown of those figures it's quite hard to match need w with the right housing housing stock and i think that's that's probably all, everyone's got case cases that show that showing the symptoms of the housing crisis uh, nora and then mark um to sort of follow up on what fiona was saying so um because of the one of the things that um, the report that Fiona already mentioned, the one that we commissioned together with Shelter, um, one of the smaller things that the report uh, mentioned was actually the impact of Brexit and the fall of the pound, or well, the value of the pound, and that that's already had an impact. So, for example, when we look back at the funding that's available for RSLs, the 10 million, in the coming years, obviously it depends on what happens with Brexit and how that goes, but it's likely that that will have a huge impact, not just because of the fall of the pound and because that means that materials get more expensive for the construction industry, but also um, the impact on the amount of workers we have in the construction industry. So, I mean, looking sort of towards the future, there um, a large degree of, uh, there's a large degree of uncertainty and it's not looking very good. And when you already are in a system um, where you're experiencing increasing problems, you know, increasing waiting lists from year to year, like what um, Mark was saying earlier with his example, it's that's all going to get a lot worse, or at least that's what it's looking like at the moment. And you really need to have that funding available to meet those needs. And on top of that, you obviously have the increase in demand that we're likely to see. So. Um, in our inquiry report, we highlighted that over the next five years, there's likely to be an 80% increase in demand for wheelchair accessible housing, which is obviously a huge increase. And that's um, part of the reason why we've called for a 10% national target. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, one thing I would add is we, we have a, a small new build program each year of maybe 60 to 100 houses each year, which is funded by the Scottish Government in part partly by ourselves. For many years, probably 15 to 20 years, one of the conditions of Scottish Government funding has been meeting a document called Housing for Varying Needs, which means that all housing associations that are funded by the Government for new build housing have to meet standards in there. And to give you some examples, it, it talks about when you're designing new houses that there's a turning circle for wheelchairs. It just needs a bit more on the space standards. The doorways are wide enough, so there's an element of of future proofing, even if the first resident that goes in there isn't using um, a wheelchair. Um, the other thing that we're able to do, and again, it, it's very much a success story and working hand in hand with the government funding, is that if we do receive notification, or say we're building bungalows of clients that have a particular adaptation need before the die is cast on the design process, we can, for instance, if someone needs a ceiling strengthened because of a tracker hoist to take them from a bedroom through to a shower room. We can get that built in. And we, we've done that on a scheme in, in the last year um, up in Elgin. And uh, we've been able to access a bit more funding from the local uh, Scottish Government office in Inverness to put in that adaptation at the build stage, which is obviously 
an awful lot more economical and efficient than doing it retrospectively later on. Um, so that's about having advance notice of <coughs> perhaps quite um, uh, unusual needs that someone might have to have, say, a tracking hoist. That's quite a rare retrospective adaptation we do, but it's particularly helpful if we have that referral made very early on in the process. Thank you. Thank you too. Uh, we seem to be moving on to the, the new build process, but just to, to, to go back to where we were with adaptations, I'd, I'd, I'm not sure I would characterise the whole system as failing. I think it's important to, to remember many people are getting adaptations done well, done quickly, that meet their need. I think in general the experience of that process is a disempowering one, and how disempowering you feel it is will depend on what tenure you're in. So owners, I think, very often feel that the whole process is taken over by the council, but they will nevertheless effectively be the people responsible for instructing the work and for the liabilities associated with the work. And I, th I think very often those roles become unclear and it becomes very difficult for owners to control work which is going on to their own home uh, in the way that they, they would like to. So there are lots of different issues around. And, it, and it's quite inconsistent with the move towards self-directed support which we see in other social care services. Uh, and I, I think we still tend to operate in a disempowering way for owners and for tenants in the way in which we deliver deliver adaptations. And I think that's part of the problem and the dissatisfaction that arises around it. But the other thing to bear in mind is that, particularly in relation to older people, most older people are owner-occupiers. 70-odd percent of people over 65 in this country own their home. The issue of housing of older people, the issue of adaptations to meet the needs of older people, is predominantly an issue in owner-occupation, not in the social rented sector. Bearing in mind that, particularly in the local authority sector, the funding is effectively there and it's drawn down on, on the rent, but it's quite substantial. I mean, every council tenant in Scotland is currently paying between a pound and a pound fifty every week towards the cost of adaptations that are being delivered to council tenants. So it means a lot of money that's being committed and the system is working for many people. I, I mean, happy to turn to the issue of, 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 of new supply if, if, if that's where we're now going, because I think there are some more fundamental issues there. But the stat that 80% of all the houses that will be standing in, in 2050 are currently standing is an important one in that respect. Okay, Kenny, you want to... Yeah, it's a follow-on from what Mark Ferry and Tony Kane have just said. I mean, I understand that 91% of all houses in the, uh, um, being provided in by local authorities and housing associations uh, meet the housing for varying needs standard. But what can we do, actually, really, to, to try and get these kind of figures up when they were not occupied and, indeed, private rented sectors? I, I, I mean, the first thing on, on housing very need, it's a 20-year-old document and it is unquestionably that it needs reviewed and, and reviewed comprehensively. And the Scottish Government has a working group that's looking at but the work hasn't started. We've not commissioned the work to rewrite that document. It doesn't deal with issues around bariatric care, for example, particularly well. It doesn't deal with issues around um, uh, dementia either because it was written in 1999 before the issues that we face around dementia became before. So there is a real issue about rewriting housing very need. My personal view is that the way to deal with future supply in the new build sector is that we should develop a single adaptability standard which applies to every house. And to give an example, I think every house should be capable of taking a track and hoist at the appropriate location. But that means you have to change the way you engineer uh, floor and roof trusses. At the moment, a private developer will put in a roof truss which is designed to do nothing other than hold up the roof and deal with the wind and the snow loads it may expect over its life. Don't be putting a trunk full of books up there because it isn't designed to take that and you will bet you will damage the, the fabric of the property if you do that. So there's something about future proofing all new builds on an adaptability basis. Thanks for that. I'm just about to floor me off to put my book collection. <laughs> you need an engineer to look at your trusses Thanks if you're in a new know. house because it won't take them. <laughs> hey, Mark, you wanted to come in on this. Um, many areas of Scotland are covered by um, care and repair schemes. Um, now, um, I was involved with one for about 25 years between the early 90s and, and a few years ago. Th these are generally funded by, and the one I'm thinking of was funded by the local authority in, in Perth and Kinross, as it happens. And over those years, virtually all, th all the work of that project gravitated towards private sector adaptations. And it was a free service guiding clients through the adaptation process. And again, like our experience uh, as a housing association, most of the work was level access wet floor showers. Uh, now, um, uh, uh, maybe other people here today can um, fill in some of the gaps for me, but I believe that most of the country is covered by care and repair schemes, that it is a free professional service that's intended to guide clients, elderly clients in the private sector, predominantly homeowners, 
but some long-term private sector tenants as well, through the process of getting an adaptation fitted. Uh, and I think my experience with the project in, in Perth and Kinross would generally be replicated at other care and repair projects um, in the country. Yeah. I'm just going to say this, repair. I, mean, I, I was a great fan of care and repair in the 1990s. I was a Glasgow councillor and I did a lot of work for my own work capacity. But the, in some areas of Scotland, the, the grants available are actually so minuscule that people just don't see the need to apply, the, the, the point in applying for them. I mean, they can be under £100, for example, and a lot of people think that the rigmarole going through care and repair is, uh, is, is, is too much for the, for the likely uh, grant available. Is it, uh, do you think perhaps it should be looked at again and there should be a consistent standard for care and repair across Scotland in terms of grant availability and the kind of things that people can apply for? Because it, it was a great scheme, but it's just been diluted by the reduction in the value of the grants in some areas. Um, I, I think that's correct. And um, it would be the case that, um, in my experience, a majority of the cost of the adaptation was met by the client themselves. Um, but where the care and repair project did come in and was an advantage was just the professional consultancy service they gave to guide people through so that they avoided the cowboys and there weren't the, the kind of post-completion defects that then held everything up. Um, um, so yes, it, there was a mix of different funding, funding ratios that, that clients had. Okay, thanks. Alexander? As a, a previous councillor and Perth and Girls Council, I'm, I'm well aware of that, that scheme that you've mentioned, Mark, uh, and it really was very successful. And you've identified some of the, the areas that were seen for the clients to be improved, and, and they felt secure, they felt safe in the process of going through some of that because they were identifying uh, individuals, organisations that could support them. Uh, but but as, as my colleague has said, if the, the grant system is an issue that falls into that too, and that, that then becomes a difficulty going forward. But I think that the, the precedent that was set and the, the, the standard that was met uh, is a good standard to have, and that could be replicated and should be replicated across uh, uh, other parts of the, of the country to see what can be achieved. But the biggest issue, uh, as we've said at the very beginning, is the, is the financial resources and the implications of that process uh, and ensuring that the, the, the supply and demand is there. Uh, we know that individuals need that support uh, and that can get that support. And that, that project gave us a real opportunity to see what the real demand was out there uh, from other clients in the, in the base. Uh, and th there was a huge opportunity uh, uh, that it can develop. But it's, it's, it's sustaining that going forward. And your views uh, would be quite useful to see how, that, how you think that could be managed. Part of the funding mix, in, in my experience, was applications to charities, which were sometimes um, successful. But uh, if the truth be told, it did rely more on someone's personal resources to meet the cost than anything else. Um, so that would be my answer. That's a barrier to the whole process. If, 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 if it's the requirement of having something and not having the financial resources or having the financial resource uh, that you have to then uh, fund it fund it yourself to make that actually happen. That, that was experience, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, did you want to come in? I mean, there is a national organisation representing care and repair projects across Scotland, Care and Repair Scotland, and you may do worse than to, take, to speak to them about their experience and how they feel about how it's working. But for the most part, I think all local authority areas have some form of care and repair scheme. It will be delivered in a variety of different ways. But Care and Repair Care Scotland will have an overview uh, of, of, of that. I, I think the other thing to say, to be fair to the Scottish Government, is that there has been quite a lot of work around alternative sources of funding, particularly for owners, um, where, where they need to move. So there's access to the, the Help to I scheme for owners, older owners who need to move, uh, and in equity release schemes as well. So there's been quite a bit of work around that but it has been very difficult not least because a lot of older owners don't particularly want to burden the equity in their property to, to carry out repairs so, improvements. Uh, the, the earlier on we were, there was quite a lot of talk about the funding rsl adaptations and does anybody have any suggestions about how the scottish government could change the process to make it easier or to make it more efficient or because there was quite a bit of 
complaining about it, but there was no suggested solutions. What do you want? To I mean, we don't get very many clients from RSLs or from local authorities because, you know, by and large, the, the, their adaptations are, 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 are sorted. Um, but I think when, when there are issues, um, a couple of things that we've been able to suggest to RSLs have been to carry out the adaptation and put a charge on the person's rent. Now, it's not an ideal solution, but it means that the work gets done and the person pays a, a, a limited rent charge for, for the time that it, it takes to pay, pay off that adaptation. Adaptation. The other thing that we've done sometimes is try and bring in charitable funding. Um, so again, if an RSL or, or a local authority, although it hasn't happened to the local authority sector, just cannot afford an adaptation, then we can help the client to either um, you know, apply to charitable sources for funding or do a self-funding campaign. And, and, and something else that we've done recently is to do a partnership with the RSL where if we can find some funding, they can provide, they can provide the materials. So I think, I think, there's, I think there, there, there are ways of being creative around it. So that, that's not the big process thing, mm -hmm. but in terms of indiv individual clients, there's yeah. ways looking at individual solutions for people. Okay. Annabelle and then. Yeah, I mean, I was struck uh, by a comment that Maureen made earlier and picking up on, on the current uh, conversation um, uh, and the position of veterans and the role of SAFA, for example, as one uh, charity in that area. Uh, and I have had experience of a constituent and the help was indeed obtained. But I'm picking up on the point, and it applies to RSLs as much as it would apply to local authorities, um, Picking up the point you made earlier, Moira, you know, it seems that if, if this situation presents itself, so I've had to experience at least one case, to the local authority it's kind of a new thing, it's sort of new and they're not quite sure how they wish to proceed and all the rest of it. Why is, why is, it, why is there not greater um, communication as between the local authorities, RSLs and people like SAFA who can be extremely helpful for, you know, the, the individual concerned and you know why can't they get their act together and get on with it and have conversations with these people to help the the people that need the adaptation i mean i think i think that is the age-old question isn't it and i think that, that even people like ourselves who do know a lot about what we know about we find new things happening every day so it's very very difficult to keep on top of absolutely everything mm. that's happening um and our experience is generally it's not any kind of ill will people are once they know that there's, a, there's an issue once they know that they can help solve that they're very willing to do so so we, we, we see a lot of goodwill across scotland i think one of the things that we've suggested in our evidence would be um, if each local authority had the equivalent of the veterans champion mm -hmm. so i think not a disability champion necessarily because that that kind of tends to suggest you know wheelchair users mm -hmm. we have lots of clients who've got children mm -hmm. on, on the autistic spectrum mm -hmm. who've got real housing issues but so a, a one-stop person mm -hmm. in a local authority mm -hmm. with a wee bit of clout who could say well i'm the the accessibility or inclusivity champion and i can put you in touch with mm -hmm. SAFA or Housing Options Scotland mm -hmm. or you know wh whoever the Help mm -hmm. to Buy scheme, um, and I think for a, very, a relatively small investment, if you had you know one person per local authority, that would certainly mm -hmm. make a difference in that kind of bringing mm -hmm. people together, the, the, the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting suggestion. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, the, the funding issue is not a straightforward one. I mean, it, you know, the idea of a tenure-neutral approach, so the government pays for everything. Um, would mean a shift of 15 or 20 million pounds onto the Scottish government. The idea of, well, landlords should pay for everything would mean a, a similar shift onto, onto tenants. And that's a pound or a pound 50 on the week for housing association tenants. So that it's not, and it's not easy to advocate that any more than it is easy to advocate the other way. I think it would just be helpful if we were clear how we expect these to be paid for, what's an appropriate burden to be placed upon the individual receiving the adaptation in terms of cost and then how the balance of that is to be funded. But the recommendations from 2012 were, were, were very clear around that, that a tenure neutral approach to the funding so that it's clear from the applicant's point of view, from the client's point of view, how the process will work is, is central to easing the complications in the process, making it more transparent and putting them more in control of the process. Can, can I just go back to something you were talking about earlier on, Lisa, the, the, the sort of breakdown where there's an ad adaptation put in, there's a problem with it, that can delay up to three months or whatever the, the case may be. Do you think it would be worthwhile if the local authorities and RSLs, etc., had uh, somebody whose responsibility was to make sure that the whole thing was done, not just passed it on to the subcontractors or the contractors and then left it in their hands, but but when they've asked for an adaptation, they have to see it through to the end. And I don't mean be on site, but make sure that uh, it's done to the completion of the, the client's requirements. Yeah, I think a kind of project manager, if you like, because 
I mean, it's putting pressures elsewhere, isn't it? You've maybe got other agencies involved pushing, well, do you know what? We can't actually use this adaptation that's been put in. So you've maybe got, we've maybe, you know, OTs are on the case, social, social workers also pushing. So it uses up our time, you know, and, and other agency staff time. Whereas it, I don't see it would be too difficult to have someone overseeing the work getting done, but I don't quite know how that would... Well, somebody has to be responsible for uh, agreeing the adaptation in the first place and the mm -hmm. funding available for it. So you would think there must be some mechanism that they could make sure that somebody carries, make sure that the job is carried out from start to adequate completion. I wouldn't have thought that would have been that difficult to achieve. Okay. Yeah. I mean, is this not information that we can seek from... Uh, from the local authorities as to how they I, actually I go I think about from it. this discussion there'll be quite a lot of information yeah, we'll be seeking from local authorities. It'd be really helpful to know how they actually, yeah. from start to finish, yeah, what the process is. Absolutely. So I think you will find that in many cases a single point of contact is the approach that is taken. How, how well that works is another matter. Mm -hmm. But the point about asking the local authorities, just to make the point again, it's the IJB that has statutory responsibility for delivering these services. You should ask the IJB. We will the IJB, the IJB, the the IJB will ask questions. The IJB will ask the local council though, because they won't have the information. Well, okay, but somebody's got the information. Yeah, I, I get well, that, but, but we have a confusion about where the responsibility for these things well, sit. We don't because yeah. the IJB, as you've said, are technically in charge. So uh, you know, it's let, let's not have a debate around about that. We we'll we'll find should out and, and get they, your act together. Yeah, and they, they then will take action accordingly. Yeah, no, so. Okay, uh, Graham? Yeah, just a, a, a quick question for Tony Kane. Tony, you mentioned um, a few minutes ago a figure of 15 to 20 million for taking a 10 year neutral approach. I wonder, where, where do you get that figure from? Well, I mean, the Scottish Government is at the moment committing something in the order of 13 million pounds through TMDF and stage three adaptations. There is a sum on top of that being spent by housing associations, probably three to five million. Uh, and on top of that, uh, the expenditure by local authorities in the public, which is the rent money, uh, again, which is about 15 to 16 million. So there's 30 million being spent. There's another 18 million or so being spent in elsewhere. If you wanted to replace that whole with the single pot from the Scottish government, it's about 30, 34 million, about 15 of which is additional to what the Scottish government is currently spending. So it's, but it's this is back of the fad packet stuff. <laughs> Smoking's bad for your health. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else that's got any comment at this stage that they'd like to, to raise? Andy? Thanks, Commissioner. I just wanted to follow up the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission's report because um, back in May we had the, the Minister coming in, I think in the week indeed, that the report was published, um, suggesting that the 10% target wasn't something that he was very comfortable with. Um, he said, I do not necessarily want an arbitrary figure for what is required to be plucked from the air. Um, the government have a statutory duty to respond to your commission's report. Um, have they done so and what discussions have taken place around that target? So they haven't responded yet. We don't have a formal response, but we're going to get one and we've been in touch with the civil servants working on the response. Um, so there are various reasons for why we haven't gotten one yet. Um, partly sort of the shift uh, in ministers and they want to get several ministers involved in the response. So we know that the minister is not going to agree to our call for a target, which doesn't mean that we're not going to keep on asking for it. Um, but what we've tried to do now is to look at some of the other recommendations that we've had uh, following the report. So um, at the end of the report, there's a list of recommendations and the national target is just one of them. And we will keep pushing for it, but there are also other uh, recommendations that we want the government to look at and that we would like them to respond to. And, and why do you think that 10% is not going to be a, agreed to, given that we've heard the work that housing associations do to future-proof their homes, it seems reasonable that all new homes should be future-proofed with regard to the changing needs of people using their own home. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and that's why we're going to keep on pushing for the target. And I mean, it's important to note that that's supposed to be a minimum. It doesn't prevent local authorities from setting you know, much higher targets, and we would love to see that. Um, 
my comment about the minister not agreeing to the car target was more sort of based on what the minister has said and what the civil servants have said. Okay. Um, but yeah. And um, coming back to a point that Tony Kane made about essentially pooling funding, I mean, if you look at things like energy efficiency, I think the public have got a reasonable idea now about where to go for that. Um, I think it's still a little bit uncertain, but broadly speaking, um, they know where to go. Government does a reasonably good job of promoting uh, energy efficiency and signposting where people should go and what funds are available, um, etc. I mean, is that the kind of approach we need in the medium term, sort of pulling funds, clear signposting, so that we do get both a tenure neutral approach and um, a system that's based on the the, the individual needs of, of um, individual uh, occupiers? I, I, I think it could be. I think the difficulty, though, is that it would be inappropriate to take rent from tenants and spend it on somebody else's home. So the ring fence that sits around at the HRA and should sit around uh, Housing Association tenants' rents means that that money needs to just be redirected to, to those properties. So yep. it's and the balance around that. So yes, a single pot would be useful, but how you manage that pot behind the scenes needs to be properly fair to uh, to owners and tenants. But I think there, there are some parallels, are they not, with energy efficiency measures? Because um, some tenants' money in council housing is used for... I, I think the parallel is that uh, the tenants pay more for energy efficiency measures than owners do. They get less support. Most of what's been done on energy efficiency in the last 10 years has come directly from rents, and very little of it has come from elsewhere, whereas owners have, have received uh, more substantial subsidy when work has been done to their homes. Um, but, yes, there are parallels. I think the, the point in the end, and it's really well articulated in the 2012 report and quite well supported by the report from the uh, EHCR is that it needs to be a transparent process that people can negotiate and control their own way through so they know what they have to pay, they know where the balance is coming from and they're in control of how the work is pl planned, programme specified and the quality of the work at the end of the day. And I think that's often the bit that's missing. Yeah, it was more to go back to the HRC point, but um, I think the 10% are probably wandering into my personal views, I'd always defer to Tony and others on <laughs> Housing Association and, and Council Finances, but given the needs profile and the ageing population projections and the wheelchair projections and things, there does seem to be a huge disparity between current and future need and what is being provided. I don't know whether it's 10% or 20% or whether a target is the thing, but there does need to be a drive towards trying to build houses that are accessible or adaptable in the, in the medium to long term, because uh, and I think maybe it's a bit of work around the ROI of doing that because it, I appreciate for house builders who are already under a lot of uh, pressure with the upscaling of the house building program that it's very expensive and there's a lot of issues with delivery of the 50,000 uh, in quite a short time scale anyway. But it, there's got to be some work done to show that, that longer term there are savings across not just housing but other other um, parts of the of the public sector picture health and social care most notably in terms of p keeping people in their homes for longer and reducing as Mark was saying the kind of um, care and support packages in people's homes so I think um, it needs to be looked at how we how we future proof the house houses more fully than um, individual pockets of kind of good practice because I think what all the reports show is that it's very very um, inconsistent so there's a lot of good um, developments that are, are going far beyond the 10% and others where there's barely any accessible housing being built. Okay, thank you very much. Um, once again, just back to uh, Nora's point, as an organisation, we're very much in favour of at least 10% of um, new, new builds to, to be wheelchair accessible or adaptable. I think um, kind of what we're a bit concerned about setting local level targets because on a general general point, a lot of local authorities don't really know the demand within their own areas for accessible housing, and that's kind of why we're saying sort of 10%, um, and it does vary a lot. I mean, Glasgow has committed to sort of 10% level for, I think, its units, more than, more than 30 units, so, but as we say, some local authorities, it's, it's really low, and I think it's just the information they themselves have. Um, just generally reading reports, it can be quite sparse, and they, if they don't realise the demand in their areas, it's quite difficult for them to set local targets. How wide 
don't they realise the demand? I think a lot of it is based on who they have on waiting lists, etc. But I think there's there's hidden needs. You know, the, it's about them knowing um, households that maybe do need to be moved. A lot of it is based on on you know waiting lists that they have, housing waiting lists. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tony, you I, I, I will, if I may. I, local authorities work very hard to understand demands in their area and to use what information is available to them so that they can plan to meet the needs mm -hmm. of people who have particular needs in housing. It is just not very easy. And bear in mind that building something for an individual might be the solution, and that does happen fairly frequently, but you have to be able to build it in the right place. Mm -hmm. So the offer that you have, you have sites where you have sites. They may not be where particular individuals with disabilities or with a need for a wheelchair house want to live. So it's not as straightforward as, well, you've got to build them there. Build 10% in that development, you'll meet the needs for wheelchair units. Well, if that development's in Stirling and you happen to live in Aberfoyle, it's no use to you at all. So that the geography of it makes it much more complicated. Not everybody comes forward and identifies themselves. There is a lot of work around that. Typically, in the end, what you tend to do with highly adapted houses is they're done on a bespoke basis. So very often, either as a stage two, somebody's identified during the design process, or you knew before you started. And, and very often, those types of highly adapted houses will be done, built on a bespoke basis. I mean, I was head of housing in Stirling for eight years. I think we built five in those eight years specifically for identified individuals. So that does go on. But it is very difficult, which is why, in the end, I mean, I, there is a debate about whether a wheelchair accessible target is helpful. I think the Minister has been clear about where he sits on that, and I understand his position. Um, my preference would be if everything was built to a, an appropriate, adaptable standard in every tenure, then going forward, you would, you would have a solution. Okay, thank you. Monique? Thank you, convener. Um, just to go back to um, what Noda was saying, it sounds quite positive, the correspondence between um, yourselves and government, particularly if there is a, a cross um, portfolio approach because housing is not just a matter for the housing minister. Um, if we've got bad housing, the government won't meet its objectives on improving health and um, clothing attainment and gap in education and so on. Um, I noticed that, that one of your recommendations, one of the HRC's recommendations is for local authorities to meet their duty to publish their equality impact assessments alongside their their, their ships or their strategic housing investment plans. And I was looking in your report and, you know, it's quite disappointing to, to read, and this was back in, in May this year, so there may have been progress, but in the EHRC survey, um, local authorities were asked how they dis discharged their equality duties and only 41% had carried out equality impact assessments on their local development plan. And this committee is looking at the, the planning bill at the moment and we've raised these similar issues. So I wonder, Nora, if you can speak to that, if there's an update on that that, that ask in your report, and maybe from Tony, um, because we've just talked about the importance of mainstreaming equality, but it sounds like there are some real barriers on the ground to, to doing that work early on in the process. Um, I mean, we're working on the follow-up on the inquiry at the moment, so we're looking at uh, things that we can do in the future to sort of take that forward. As far as the quality impact assessments, I mean, it's not just which local authorities have done them, it's also the, uh, the quality of those impact assessments and what they've looked at. So that's another issue. And it comes back to other areas as well. So with the city deals and the regional deals, um, we're doing some work around engaging with those local authorities to look at what they're doing. And obviously housing is a huge part of that. Um, and there we're, s we're making some progress, but of course it takes time. And unfortunately we do see um, cases where they could do a lot better. And then we see some cases where there's some good practice. Um, so do you have particular examples to hand? I mean, out of the, the 40% mm. that, that are doing the quality impact assessments, you know, are there some that are doing it you know, to a really high standard? Um, I'm not sure. I can get back to you okay. on that. But um, I would expect that some are good and others okay. aren't. But yeah. So, yeah, I'm just wondering why it's such a mixed picture. I mean, these are 
you know, legal duties on yeah. local authorities. So I wonder if Tony can elaborate. And, and on that basis, all I can say is that mm -hmm. the expectation is that local authorities, all public agencies, local authorities are not the only public bodies who can sometimes be a bit tardy in producing or publishing uh, equality impact assessments, but the EQIA should be prepared during the policy development process. It should be published at the point at which the policy is accepted. I would go a little further. I actually think equality impact assessing is one thing, but a full equality is proofing exercise really ought to be what goes around some of our more substantial uh, programs and policies, like development plans, uh, and, and SHIPS might be an example of them. My, my colleagues get a bit tired of me reminding them of the statutory obligations and the importance yeah. of producing these things. Can I ask why that is, Matt? I don't want to keep pressing this point because we've discussed it in the planning bill scrutiny, but you know, that equality proofing work shouldn't be, you know, an add on that has to surely be integral. So why does it feel like a burden to, to people? It, well it it <laughs> Yeah, it, it doesn't feel like a burden to me, um, but it, it's it's not an area that everybody is entirely comfortable with. Much of the data around equalities impacts is difficult to source uh, and isn't always clear, and not everybody's always comfortable with some of the conversations that they need to have as part of that process. Measuring, for example, housing impacts and housing issues in, re in relation to the LBGT community isn't easy to do, and it, these are difficult conversations sometimes to have, even just asking basic questions, because you, you need to ask some quite telling questions in order to discover that that community is suffering housing disadvantage. So it's, it, it is something that we need to get better at, but it's not just local authorities that struggle with equalities impact assessments, I would say. I, I mean, I can point to other public agencies who've been tardy in completion of these things. Although we are the local government committee, so... Yeah, I get that, they, they, yes. They're our responsibility. <laughs> yeah. No, I, and, and, and I wouldn't defend it. They need to be yeah. done, they need to be done properly, they need to be done to a standard, and people need to understand those, the policy implications and the choices they're making. I absolutely agree with that. Okay, right, thank you. Graham, you wanted to come in? Yeah. Uh, just going back to the, uh, the, the, the previous point, um, I remember when Kevin Stewart was, was here before, and uh, I asked him, uh, following up on the, the, the shelter re report, are we building the right homes in the right places? And I'm not misquoting him. That he didn't. He didn't know. He asked me to write to him um, with a more detailed question, which I did. Um, he responded to me, and he still doesn't know. Um, I'm none the wiser, nor nor was he. So it seems to me that th this is information we should have if we have a target. Um, we should know what is being built, where it's being built, um, are the right homes being built. In, in the right places, and I accept the difficulties that Tony Kane has uh, has outlined, but it's not an excuse to say it's difficult. Um, I think we, you know, we need to make it. We need to make more of an effort. And if it's if the minister wants to say, well, it's down to councils. Well, maybe it is down to councils, but we should be telling or advising councils how they should be getting that information. Uh, I. Yeah, I accept what you're saying, but I'm not really sure how, how straightforward it would be to decide uh, that these are the right places for those types of houses to be built. But, you know, for the, for the Minister, I mean... It's a fairly wide-ranging question. I, I, my view is that the Affordable Housing Investment Programme is not directing investment to the right places, and I think the evidence that was produced through the uh, homelessness and rough sleeping action group in relation to pressure around homelessness demonstrates that very clearly. So... The recommendation has been made to three of the Edinburgh and two of the Lothian authorities that they need to allocate over 100% of all social lets in their area to meet the needs of homeless people. It, it, if that isn't an absurd recommendation, it's certainly an unachievable one. But it dem and that's and it's it's the f equivalent figure for Glasgow is is below 50%. It's pretty clear that delivering half the programme in the west of Scotland, which is where we are, isn't focusing new supply and affordable housing in the areas where it is most in shortage. But I think to be fair, part of the problem is we haven't really come to a clear view about what we're trying to achieve through the affordable housing uh, uh, investment programme. And as a simple example, in um, East Renfrewshire, about 12% of the homes are in social renting, and in West Dumbarton, about 37% of the homes are in social renting, and in this city, about 19% of the homes are in social renting. Which of those three figures is appropriate in terms of a well-functioning housing market? And we don't have an answer to that question, so it's difficult to measure what impact we're having. Uh, Annabelle, and then Fiona. Uh, thank you. I, I mean, obviously, we're now on to the very important issue of, of availability of homes, of the number of homes versus the number of people needing homes, be they homes that can be adapted or, or otherwise. And I was struck by 
a statistic to the effect that there are some 1,000 empty service family homes in Scotland as we speak. And would it not therefore be a, a resource for veterans that the MOD could release this housing for veterans? Is, is that something that anybody has actually taken up with the MOD? I mean, Shelter, for example, or, or, or Alaco, you know, taken up with the MOD. There's all this housing sitting there and there's veterans who are homeless. Why are the two things not... Uh, meeting such that the MOD releases this housing for, for veterans and, and has that issue been explored? Perhaps Fiona would. I'll come in, but I'll have to defer the specifics of MOD housing to, to, to Moira. But in terms of the issue of empty homes, mm. there are a lot of empty homes ac across Scotland. We think in the region of 35,000 is the work we we do. Um, Shelter Scotland is funded by the Scottish Government to um, deliver the empty homes partnership so that is a program of specifically bringing privately owned empty homes across scotland back into use by working with local authorities to uh, find owners incentivize bringing them back into use selling them whatever it is it's kind of painstaking work um but I, we've brought back thousands of homes back into use it's never going to be the silver bullet to the housing crisis but it is bringing a valuable resource back into some form of of um housing stock that, that's usable so it's really really valuable and it's a really great program and and many local authorities now have a permanent empty homes officer in place which is really really positive and that work has just been refunded for the next five years uh, that's not mod specific though that is just privately yeah, owned is the issue, is that something that shelter has taken up at some point with it's the not it's not something that we've taken up at all and and, and i'll um let uh, Moira speak to that. I suppose just 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 to come back just quickly on the on the ships and the uh, local housing needs demand assessments and what have you. It is quite a complicated picture, but it does have to be locally led. I don't think we can have national anything. It has to be local authority and partners informed. Otherwise, you're going to get a blanket solution that doesn't work in in rural, urban, uh, high density, whatever it is. And so that does have to be locally led. But what the ships report that we produced earlier in the year with the HRC. Um, told the story of very clearly is that there is no uh, consistent methodology, no consistent reporting, there is no consistent data set. So uh, I appreciate, Graham, it's, it's not sufficient to say it's tricky, but it is tricky. Um, <laughs> it's quite hard to identify and and correlate and work out what the na national picture is. So I think we all need to be alive to the idea that the 50,000 might be numerically met, but the, the, the need may not be. And I think that is next level analysis that we need to think about, Chef Scotland needs to think about taking forward to work out where is the identified need and are new houses meeting that need in the most cost effective way. And I think the reason the minister and others haven't been able to give um, a clear answer is because that that is not yet proven. There is um, not a piece of work or a data set that shows that the investment in the 50,000 affordable homes program is therefore reducing housing need mo where it is most acute. And so we do need to, to improve the data sets and the analysis before we can project what the next house building program should look like. Okay, thank you. Uh, before, excuse, excuse me a minute, before I let Moira in, can I just remind people that we're talking about adaptations here. We have kind of veered off the subject a bit, but yours. Just say briefly, I think the MOD plays its cards pretty close to its chest. The, 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 their houses are not part of the kind of civilian housing landscape, so we don't get the same information that we ha that we have about other housing stock. Um, I think the, they're now moving to a new model where, where accommodation isn't provided by the MOD, and people are going to be given um, an uplift on their salary to source their own accommodation locally, which is going to be another huge problem, particularly if you're based at Lookers and trying to find affordable housing there. But it's maybe something that I could take up out with this meeting and perhaps mm -hmm. report back to you, because I think mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is a good idea. Um, so I'll, I'll do that. Uh, would that not then, if, if, if this new system is going to be in place, would that not make it easier for the MOD to get rid of the, those existing premises then? I, I think my, my, my understanding is from our clients is that the stock is actually in pretty bad condition. And yeah, and you, you maybe wouldn't, wouldn't actually want it, or you'd have to pay an awful lot of money to bring it up okay. to what we would consider to be, a, you know, a good, a good standard. But again, I think there's, this is that's part of a much bigger and broader yeah, discussion. Yeah. And well, yes, um, okay. but yes, but, but, but potentially be able to add to the housing stock within Scotland in a substantial way if it's done properly. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any other issues they would like to raise? Did you want back in there, Annabelle? No, no, I didn't think so. No, hey, Moira. 
me. Um, I think something that, that we see a lot of is that the fact that Scotland's got lots of different housing markets. In, in Glasgow, there are 60 RSLs, so if you're looking for a house in Glasgow, potentially 60 applications. In Edinburgh, housing is, is, you know, is, is, is in really short supply. There's other bits of Scotland where if you wanted a house this afternoon, you could, you could have one. And I think one of our frustrations is that people don't know that whole Scottish picture. And there are some people, we, we have a client who moved recently from a, a third floor flat in Inverness to a wheelchair adapted property in Greenock. He was very happy to move to Greenock. Nobody in Greenock or the local area wanted this house for whatever reason. So I definitely think that although adaptations are something that we need to look at, I think that there is, a, there is potential that we're spending money on adaptations that we, we could actually look at another solution and either leave that house for somebody else who needs it, doesn't need it adapted, or adapt it for somebody else. So I think that if there was a way of encouraging people to look beyond their existing local authority area or into an adjacent local authority, you might just find that the adaptation spending be becomes more effective because we're spending it where we really need to rather than just because there's a, a kind of current crisis that we need to, to spend on. That's just something that, that we've, we've found very powerfully from our clients. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think that's us finished with the questions. Is there anybody who would like to make any final comment before we bring this session to a close? Um, hey, Lisa. Just, we work with a lot of um, hospital occupational therapists, and I just think cost-wise, there's bed blocking in effect. Um, do you know you've maybe had someone who's a life-changing injury and just cannot go back to their property? Um, and we have clients that are put in interim care homes. I mean, with a, with a lad of 23 that's been in a care home for a year because he's just not been able to find accessible housing. Um, and obviously can't go back to, to the family home. So I think, and obviously that causes pressures on the health surface. Um, so I guess it swings and roundabouts a little bit. It's kind of um, having more accessible housing to get people maybe discharged from hospital quicker and not have to go into to care homes, which can be pretty pretty grim. Okay, thank you for getting that on the record then. Can I uh, thank everyone for attending and uh, just to say that the committee will discuss the evidence in private later in the meeting and that the evidence will help inform the committee budgetary recommendations later this autumn. We, you'll all, the witnesses today will be notified of these recommendations when they're published. And thank you very much again. That was a very useful session for us. Thank you. I'll suspend the, the meeting for a couple of minutes to clear the gallery.